Have you ever met someone and found yourself wondering, are they all there? Like, you know what I'm talking about. Situation where you meet somebody and you're like, are they all right? You know, and, the, and you don't generally say it out loud, but you kind of wonder. One of the things that happens at every church is that uh, sometimes you will have somebody knock on the church door or ring the bell or, or you know, push the buzzer during the week. And a lot of the time, those people are honestly, sometimes they carry the kinds of things that make you say, are they all there? You ever wonder how many people thought that about Jesus? I mean, I, I think we forget the fact that Jesus said some things that honestly, from a human perspective, in the eyes of this world, people would say, is he all there? And they would say, no. He said, love your enemies. Well, that seems kind of crazy. But he also said, give to anyone who asks. What does that do to your bank account? He also said things like, well, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, the whole Sermon on the Mount is blessed are those who are persecuted. Really? I mean, that's not a sane thing to say. If somebody were to say to you, oh, my life is great because there are all these people in my life who give me a hard time and they mock me and they hate me and they work against me, at a certain point, wouldn't you say, this person's not all there? Last week, we looked at a story when Jesus had a rich guy come to him and say, hey, how can I know God? How can I have eternal life? And the guy said, and Jesus says, okay, you need to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You know, that's the number one or two sign of a cult. Right? The top two things that they identify that you need to be aware of if you're, if you have a, a friend or a family member who's in some questionable group is you have to say, are they trying to separate you from your family? And Jesus said, um, I have come to turn people against their families. And the other thing is they want you to sign over your stuff. I mean, we, I know that some of you are thinking right now, wait, wait, this is, this is the scripture. In fact, I don't remember where it came from, but there's an old statement that um, we used to say um, in my youth group when I was in youth ministry, we would say, well, that there's crazy talk. Most of what Jesus said in the Gospels was crazy talk. In fact, the Bible says that. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says the message of the cross is foolishness to the world. And it doesn't just mean that the message of the cross is hard for the world to understand. It's saying the message of the cross is crazy talk. I heard a preacher say once that if you go to church and Jesus sounds rational and sane, it's not Jesus. 
if you're taking notes, that's the first thing there. If, if he always sounds rational, he's not Jesus. If he always sounds sane to you, he's not Jesus. Because our definition of sanity and rationality in our lives is based on what makes sense to us, right? And scripture says over and over again, it doesn't make sense to us. So let's read this scripture. Um, Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long? Because all day long doing nothing. Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. I'm sorry. Let me say that. We have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Now we're going to read three more verses at the end of the message. But let's look at this story first. This would have been a familiar parable with a twist. In fact, Jesus often did that. There are some stories that Jesus tells that were common stories, but he tells it differently. It's like if you were to hear the story of um, the Goldilocks and the three bears, and it said, you know, and Goldilocks came in and she ate the first bowl of porridge and it was too hot and she ate the second bowl of porridge and it was too cold but the third one was and then she died. You would have said, wait, that's not how the story goes. Well, that's what Jesus does here. In the common story that rabbis told, the Last received a full day's pay because they worked harder. That was a common story that if you work really hard, you can make up for the fact that you've wasted most of your day. But that's not what Jesus says. Now, I think it's important to remember that 
Jesus has just talked to this rich young ruler. We talked about this last week. And the rich young ruler came and said, how do I get eternal life? I love having a baby here. I really do. Oh, don't take him out. It's okay. Um, but um, they, the rich young ruler came and said, how do I get eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what does the word of God say? He says, well, the commandments are this and this and this. And Jesus says, okay, that's it. And the guy says, well, yeah, I've done those. But I feel like something's missing. And Jesus says, oh, and one more thing. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And after that guy leaves, sad, Peter comes up and says, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And we don't know whether Peter is going, hey, we've already done that. We're going to get a, a lot, right? We don't know what he means. Because there's kind of a hint of desperation and question and doubt in Peter's voice. And Jesus says, you will receive many times more than what you've given. But he also goes on and says, that's not the point. The last shall be first, the first shall be last. So Jesus says, for the kingdom of heaven... Now, there's a contrast between two kingdoms in this, in this whole section of the book of Matthew. Um, and we have to choose which one we're going to be part of. There's the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, other places. But, and then there's the kingdom of this world. And Jesus makes it clear we have to decide which kingdom we are going to live as citizens of. Now, we want to be both, right? We want to be, um, to fit in well in the kingdom of God and fit in well in the kingdom of this world. But that doesn't work, does it? There's a certain point, there are many certain points where it doesn't work. So as we look at this, we have to realize there's two kingdoms and we have a choice. It's like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his, vi for his vineyard. Now that would have been a common, very familiar situation in those days. Um, there would have been in the marketplace a lot of laborers waiting to be hired. I mean, many more day laborers than we ever would see. But they would be there and it would start out first thing in the morning and the most industrious would be there at the beginning. So it's clear as a listener in Jesus' day, you would have known that the first ones, the ones there at six in the morning, were the, the really good workers. Because they got up. I mean, if you've ever had a job that you had to get up and be there at 6 a.m., that can be challenging. So the landowner comes in and says, I'll hire you and you and you and you, and I'll pay you a denarius. Now, a denarius is kind of an uncertain amount of money, but we know that it's basically a way of expressing a day's wages. So he's saying to them, I'll hire you, you'll work for me for a day, and I'll pay you the acceptable the acceptable amount 
So it's a clear agreement. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. Now, do you notice the difference? The six o'clock guys, he said, I'll pay you this amount. The nine o'clock guys, he says, I'll pay you a fair wage. Now, that's a little tricky if you're an employee, employee, right? Like if you were hired for a new job and you said, hey, how much am I going to get paid? And they'll say, yeah, when a payday comes around, we'll see what's fair. You're thinking, I don't know about that. But the implication would be about three-fourths of a denarius. A day was 12 hours. We're blessed to have an eight-hour work day, if you have an eight-hour work day. <laughs> um, but the implication would be about three-fourths of a denarius. So they went and worked, and he went out again about noon. The day's half done, and about three in the afternoon, and did the same thing. Again, there's no wage agreement. He apparently is going to pay them whatever is right. About five in the afternoon, and in their, um, in their economy, basically that means there was about hour left in the day he goes out and founds still others standing around <laughs> he said why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing most scholars that really study these t this time of history would say that those people that are there are probably, at this point, the least desirable workers. Because they're still there. Maybe they slept in, you know, they kind of tied one on the, on the night before. They woke up drunk about noon, and they, you know, finally about four o'clock said, oh, I should go to the marketplace. And, or maybe they were, they had, they were weak, or they didn't have much to offer as a laborer. So they are likely to be the late birds who didn't get a worm. Honestly, they're, this is the leftovers. No one has hired us, they said. He said, you also go and work in my vineyard. No mention of pay scale. I think that matters. Six o'clock in the morning, the full day, he says, here's what I'm going to pay you. Then he says, at nine and noon and three, I'm going to pay you what is fair. These people come and they go to work, probably figuring, well, whatever he pays me is better than nothing. When the evening come, the owner of the vineyard says to his foreman, Call them in and pay their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. Now, that's kind of backwards, isn't it? Because, you know, these people that have been working all day long, shouldn't they get their pay first? I mean, they're tired. And, and in case we're going to run short of money... We want to make sure, it seems fair, doesn't it? That they would be paid first. But he says, no, pay the last ones first. And so they come up, and you can imagine this. Get this in your mind. They call up the people that have just been, they barely broke a sweat, okay? And they came up, and they give them a full day's pay. Now, 
Put yourself in two different pairs of shoes at this point. If you're a five o'clock worker and you get a full day's pay, what, what emotion are you feeling? Shout it out. Joy, gratefulness. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. You're excited. You're excited. But if you're a nine o'clock person in the morning or a six o'clock person, what are you thinking? I think there's two options here. Yeah, part of you, you could be thinking, wow, if they got a full day's pay, what am I going to get? Or you're thinking, is this guy, is he all there? Or you're thinking, well, that's not fair. They got more than they should. Jesus is making it clear that he extends kindness and grace and love and provision to the unworthy. Please understand, when we talk about the Protestant work ethic, we're talking about a good thing, but it's a twist on biblical truth when we say, well, everybody gets what they deserve. In fact, do you really want what you deserve? Scripture says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, when we, and what are, the, what are the wages of sin? Death. While we deserve death, Jesus gave us life. And so the last thing we should ever say as Christians is, I just want justice. I just want what's fair. I just want what's coming to me. In fact, if you go back and you read any of the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Matthew, you see Jesus reaching out intentionally to the unworthy or to at least people that that society would have said are unworthy. Jesus is reaching out to lepers. They're not worthy. They're, they're dirty and filthy and diseased. And everybody knew that ultimately if you had leprosy, there was some sin that led to that, right? No, but still, they're not worthy. And several times, People bring children to Jesus, and Jesus says, let them come to me, and they're not worthy. A centurion comes to him, a centurion who is a person that was subjugating and enslaving, effectively, the Jewish people. He was enslaving and punishing and ruling over the people of God. Is he worthy of the great? and mercy and love. No, he's not. In fact, this is written by Matthew, a tax collector, a person who has turned his back on his people, has, been, um, has really been a traitor to the people of God. And it says that Jesus was going by the tax collector's booth, which means is Matthew at that point still doing this awful thing? Yeah, he's in the booth. And Jesus says, follow me. He's extending grace to people who don't deserve it. So when those who came who were hired first in verse 10, they thought they're going to get more. But they received a denarius. They began to grumble. 
No, no, those people, they worked only an hour. You've made us, made them equal to us. I worked so hard, and it was so hot. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? See, they're getting what they agreed to. If, if they had not seen the other people get paid, and that's why it's interesting that the, the owner of the vineyard said, pay the last people first, because that guarantees that the six o'clock people would see the unfairness of their wages. And if they had not seen that, they would have been fine with it, right? If they'd been paid first, they would have said, oh, that's fine. See, that's is part of the problem with coveting. Is that as soon, we, as soon as we begin to compare, we're okay until we realize that others have more. But the landowner says, take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? There's a focus here on God's ownership. God has the right to to do what he wants with what is his. And what is his? Everything. This is crazy stuff. We should be offended by this because it's exactly the opposite of what we have been taught to believe. Interesting question. He says, are you envious because I am generous? The implication seems to be that the six o'clock workers would say, I got what I deserve. I'm glad. Thank you, sir, for hiring me. And then when you look at the others, you would say, and that is so beautiful that you are so generous with them. But honestly, would you think that way if you were in that situation? I don't think I would. So the last will be first and the first will be last. What does this tell us about God? First of all, God is God and he owns everything. He has the right to do what he wants with what is his. And we need to be really careful when we start to say what God should do is. But I find that in my heart sometimes, don't you? Find that in your own heart, in your own mind. You're like, well, if God really knew what he was doing. Now, notice that the landowner doesn't say, this is why I paid them more. He didn't have to justify it. Because it's his. And one of the things that we need to hold on to is in Isaiah 55, God says through the prophet Isaiah, he says, you know what? My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As far as the heavens are above the earth, which by the way is not X number of miles. It's infinite. It's not like you could get in a rocket ship and, you know, go a thousand miles and there's heaven. There is an infinite divide. 
between God's thoughts and our thoughts. And there are certain times that we need to say, I don't get it, God, but you're God. So what does this tell us about us? Well, first of all, it's a bad sign when we find ourselves thinking, God, that's not fair. Now, notice, I think it's significant that the landowner doesn't really scold them. He doesn't yell at them. In fact, if anything, he seems to almost be saying, I get it. I understand why you're asking this. In fact, he says, um, he calls them friend. He says, um, I, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. But we need to see ourselves as five o'clock workers. Because you know what? I'm a five o'clock worker. You are a five o'clock worker. And the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ looks at each of us and says, I love you anyway. You blew it today. I love you anyway. You haven't done with your life what I called you to do. I, I love you anyway. You have not been what I call you to be, but you're, you're one of my people. God is insanely generous. He adopted us. That's amazing. Some of us were here last night for a, um, an adoption fundraiser for Dave and Ashley Blummer. And this girl that they're adopting is 13 years old and has done nothing to be worthy of their love and their adoption. But they, by the work of God in their lives, placed their affection on her. And, and Ashley talked about how, you know, they have a, a, this poster-sized picture of Maria. That's her name. And sometimes Ashley says, we will talk to that poster and I'll take it with me when I go places. And we're already treating her as a member of the family. It's not because of anything Maria has done. It's simply grace. And if we think we deserve anything, we're diminishing the love and the grace and the kindness of God. We need to think of ourselves as five o'clock workers. Now, you might be thinking... Ah, yeah, I know I'm not perfect, but compared to that person or those people, I'm pretty close to a six o'clock. Okay, I'm a nine o'clock worker. A lot of us would say, I don't want to think of myself too highly, so I'm a noon kind of guy. No. We are all five o'clock. What does this tell us about following Jesus? If we wait for things to make sense to us, it'll never happen. If we wait for God to explain and justify his own work, we'll never get there. Because even if he explained it, our hearing is... broken right you know this you've had relationships especially if you've ever been ever been married 
prayed, you know that there were times when you were talking and you know you were speaking clearly, right? And what your spouse heard was Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. We will not hear it. And that's why at a certain point, Jesus didn't call his disciples, and he doesn't call us today. First of all, he doesn't call us to believe in him. He calls us to follow him. In fact, at one place in the Gospels, it says there were these people that Jesus had called to be with him. The only way we begin to understand the heart of Jesus, the ways of Jesus, the priorities of Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus, is to be with him. To walk with him. To allow his presence to transform us. Kind of like a four-year-old boy with his dad. Don't you love that when you go to a, um, like a grocery store and you see, um, let's make it mom. Mom is pushing the grocery cart and there's a little cart with a little person behind it not aware of what groceries they need in fact often if you let that child choose the groceries it's a big problem why do we need an entire cart of cookies But the child looks at the parent and says, I want to be like them. I want to be with them. So ultimately, this tells us about God. It tells us about us. But ultimately, I think it tells us that we need to be with Jesus. The last three verses, Jesus says, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief, pre chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. He said this several times to the disciples. And they don't get it. I don't know that I would get it either. Because I wouldn't want to. It only makes sense if you understand that the economy of Jesus is different. That the fairness of God is is different. God can't be unfair because God is fairness. God can't be unloving because God is love. So ultimately, I think this passage calls us to be with Jesus, to trust him, push our little grocery cart along beside him or behind him and let him teach us things that don't make sense to us and ultimately we find ourselves at the end of the day receiving grace beyond grace out of the generosity of the Father.